This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day, wherever you're listening from, and welcome to episode 486 of IAQ Radio. It's Friday, December 1st, 2017, and this week we welcome Sal LaDuca. We're going to talk about electric fields and electromagnetic frequencies and indoor environmental quality. We had Sal speak at the Healthy Building Summit about a month ago now, and uh, it was a fascinating presentation, and I look forward to a great discussion today, and I think we're going to make this a two-part series with Sal's approval. We'll uh, get the foundation down today, and then we'll go into a little more detail on um, how IEPs, or indoor environmental professionals, can do this type of work in part two. But before we get started, let's thank our marquee sponsors. IAQ Radio marquee sponsors are John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Healthy Indoor Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions are available at IAQ.net. Particles Plus, engineers and manufacturers feature rich particle counters, air quality monitoring, instrumentation, and vacuum pump technology. ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Please be sure to thank our sponsors for their support of IAQ Radio when you inquire about their services or products. Last but not least, please visit the IAQ Training Institute website for the most current dates for the training you trust at. IAQtraining.com will be down in the uh, San Air Labs, Richmond, Virginia location next Wednesday. We've got Dr. Joe Spurgeon coming in. We're going to do a really good uh, program on... Um, it's going to be on Inspection 201, Mold Inspection 201, and interpreting sample results. Look forward to seeing Dr. Spurgeon and hopefully many of the listeners there as well. And finally, we also have continuing education credits available at iaqradio.com. Email me and we'll get you a quiz out. You can get your continuing ed credits. Let's turn it over to the Z-Man for today's IAQ Radio trivia question. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnick at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man with this week's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Hello, everyone. Congratulations to Vic Cafaro, Richmond, Virginia, for being first to identify July 18, 1955 as the date a meeting of world leaders occurred in Switzerland at an event known as the Geneva Summit. The IQ Radio question for today, Friday, December 1, 2017, has been sponsored by Ideas, the solution chemistry company, creating unique solutions to odor removal surface cleaning, and decontamination problems. Here is today's trivia question. Name the inventor and scientist who in 1896 was issued U.S. patent number 568177 for an ozone generator to act on ambient air. Back to you, Joe. Thank you, Cliff. Okay, Sal LaDuca, he's an environmental consultant that specializes in the built environment, got over 40 years of experience in instrumentation and controls. He started out uh, in, the, in the military uh, as a nuclear reactor operator, and uh, he left the military, went to work with Jersey Central Power and Light, helped to build their radiological survey instrument repair facility at Oyster Creek Nuclear Power Plant. From there, he uh, migrated into their communications department. He still does that type of work today. Back in 1994, he incorporated and began offering electromagnetic field services. Um, in 1999, he branched into the indoor environmental quality with the Building Biology and Ecology Group. And then he went on to get his certifications through Indoor Air Quality Association and the American Council for Accredited Certification. When those two combined, he's got his CIEC. And let's see if we've got Sal on the line. Hello, Sal. 
I am here. All Good right. Morning. Welcome. Great to have you. Um, had a blast getting to know you a little bit at the conference and uh, listening to your presentation. So I thought, let's let's go ahead and get Sal on here and let the wider world know a little bit about this topic. We, we did one show. Uh, it's got to be six or seven years ago now, Cliff, with uh, a Bob Biology gal out of Australia who did... Um, Dr. Nicole Bilsma was her name, and and that was a very interesting show as well. So it's been a long time. So I thought, so let's let's start with the basics. But before we do, let's let's get a little bit about you. How did you first get, you know, interested in indoor environmental quality? Well, I bought the home I am living in presently some twenty years ago, and within a short few months, a few peculiar things happened. One of them was that when I had to close the windows and turn on the heat, I started gasping for air, and that was totally beyond my knowledge base and experience, and I started scratching my head, and eventually I locked onto two carpets that had not been properly vacuumed for some 20-plus years. So I was breathing the fine dust from the last 30 years of occupancy in that home. Once I took the carpets out, cleaned the rooms, I could breathe again like new. That was the first thing on indoor air quality. The second one was that the exterior walls had a sheet of paper with aluminum backing. And based on the laws of physics, anything metallic near a field takes that field and causes a secondary antenna effect. So I was getting electric fields coming from the exterior walls magnified some tenfold, and I happened to be sleeping with my head right next to the wall. And my sleep went from eight hours to something like one hour at a time until I found out what the problem was, gutted the walls, removed the paper, changed the wiring, and my sleep returned to normal. So it kind of brought things close to home. So it was, a, was it like a wallpaper or a wall covering? No, it was a sheet of paper inserted within the wall with aluminum foil on one side, which 60 years ago was thermal insulation. Oh, okay, okay. So, yeah. And uh, what about these like radiant barriers? Are you familiar with them? You know, they'll use them uh, when they're putting in, for instance, um, uh, water in the floor. You know, heat trying to heat with water in the floors, or sometimes they'll put them up in the uh, attics to try and you know reflect the heat back from uh, the sun. Are you familiar with those at all? Uh, radiant barriers, no, I'm not familiar with them. In, in a sense, that paper with the aluminum was a radiant barrier trying to reflect heat that was being produced inside, back in inside, preventing it from going outdoors. Uh, but there are some other applications, either on roofing or exterior walls, that better are better or closer to that definition of barriers that I'm not uh, familiar with and haven't had a chance to work with. You know, that, it just made me think of those because I just saw an article on that, and um, the article was kind of more about, well, they don't really perform thermally as well as people think. But um, we'll have to talk about that at a later date. Let's let's go back to the, the, the beginnings, though. So it sounds like your first connection, at least residentially, with electric and electromagnetic fields and health-related issues was the fact that you went to one hour of sleep instead of eight. Uh, were there other issues that came up along, you know, over time that led you to get more involved in this industry? Well, I noticed peculiarly the same thing happened to a nephew of mine who moved to another house when he was one month of age and within a week, he acquired a one-hour sleep pattern. And so here is this little baby, a month of age, sleeping no more than one hour at a time. My sister scratching her head thinking, okay, he's just getting adjusted to life. Thought nothing of it. When I came to visit eight months later, the kid is still locked onto the one-hour sleep pattern. Hmm. And they're pulling the hair out because they're not getting any sleep. Well, once we realized that it appeared that the power cords plugged in next to the crib we're also energizing the metallic mattress base and also energizing the boy, and we moved him from that wall. Within a week, he went to an eight-hour sleep pattern. So that's almost like the smoking gun, and that really confirmed it to me that, hey, this is a major problem. Interesting. What about bed frames? I mean, do, do bed frames, metal bed frames, act the same way? Do they you know, lead to problems? 
Yes, in the same way that a metallic mattress uh, base does. Anything metallic within an electric field will take that field and echo some of it as a secondary antenna. You can try this at home with a simple AM radio, and you go up to a metallic chair, and all of a sudden the reception is better near the chair because that thing is echoing some of the local signal it's receiving. Interesting. And so a bed frame will do the same thing with electric fields from indoor wiring. Well, let's let's go let's do a little of the basics of electric. I mean, you, you know, I wanted to use this show kind of as the foundation for people, and then we're going to you've agreed to come back and do a part two where we go into a little more on finding and solving these issues. So, um, you know, I live in a, but uh, it's probably 35, 40 year old log ranch up here at uh, the world headquarters at Indian Lake, Pennsylvania. I got a local rural electric company that supplies my electric. Um, not familiar with any major power lines close by, but you know, I know that's a concern for people. I think in, in California and maybe other places, schools aren't allowed to be within a certain number of feet of the electric power line. So let's first talk a little bit about the grid. What what kind of issues, why, why is it that some schools in some states aren't allowed to be built next to those that main grid? One is the right-of-way issue in that um, the utility needs to have clearance to install those lines, and being that they're high voltage, they need to have the physical clearance from the ground And that's part of the reason why any um, vegetation underneath it has to be controlled in the way of tree trimming and so on. And the lack of tree trimming was part of the reason it caused the outage that started in Ohio in 2003, if I recall. Um, But in addition, if let's say there is physical damage and the line or parts of it comes down, touches near the ground, the circuit breakers at the remote ends are supposed to de-energize it and make it safe. Mechanical things fail. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that there is nothing built underneath those lines, whether it is a building, whether it is trees that go above a certain height. We just want to make it safe. Um, This is not primarily a biological consideration for electric or magnetic fields. This is more a safety issue as for immediate uh, life and death kind of thing. Okay. Um, as for distance from a power line, depending on how much current or power it is carrying, 100 feet to 500 feet may not be enough. I- I've been near um, a power line that had 200,000 volts or higher, and the magnetic field was of no issue. Uh, because it was very lightly loaded. A tree buffer between that and the house eliminated the electric field. So some issues kind of disappear on their own. But indoors, in most homes, you can end up having electric fields from installed wiring and magnetic fields, depending on how it's interconnected to the rest of the local neighborhood grid or even from wiring errors within the house. So that idea of looking at the power line kind of misses a picture in that you need to look at the power line and the house both and consider what the types of emissions are in both of them. Let's back up just a moment. Can you explain for me and the listeners what it seems like there's two types of field. There's an electric field and then there's a magnetic field. Can you first of all all there you know are they different and and how so? Well, in the same way that you expect the 120 volts in your house to remain constant, no matter what you turn on or what you plug in, power lines maintain that same voltage 24-7, and the voltage produces an electric field. Current, the actual current passage that you use to produce power to actually light the lights to run your toaster, microwave oven, or whatever, that produces a magnetic field. They have different interactions biologically, so you more or less need to consider them as two different entities. Electric from voltage, magnetic field from currents. Okay. And how do, you know, the the people that are doing the work on these high power lines, uh, do they have, 
health-related issues? Um, is it from the electric current, from the electromagnetic field? Talk to us a little bit about that, so. Well, while the electric fields remain pretty much the same 24-7, magnetic fields can change on a whim, but for people who are occupationally exposed by your definition that work with electric utilities, in the immediate sense, people have to worry about burns, electrocution, or death. But in the longer term, there's at least one study um, in 11, 2016 of Ontario electric utility workers that pointed out that there was a significantly elevated risk of high exposure producing leukemia to either both to, to both electric and magnetic fields and a dose response relationship for increasing exposure to electric fields meaning the higher the electric field was or the closer they were to the line the more likely they were to succumb to effects from leukemia um, meanwhile there's another study on the street in january 2000 of childhood leukemia that disclosed a peak in occurrence for children two to four years of age following residential electrification that means just bringing power into a home so in that respect you could classify everyone using electricity as occupationally exposed sure or exposed to, to we're all exposed to some degree but do, yes. do, do the electric companies protect their workers from i mean they they protect them from being electrocuted or burned etc do they also help to protect them from the electromagnetic fields and the electric fields that they're exposed to no no uh, the electric and magnetic fields are not a consideration long term they are only a consideration if they are <clears throat> excuse me an immediate uh life or death situation either on contact or on uh approach uh, for what it's worth, there are people that do live line work on energized lines at 350,000 volts or above, and these guys wear fully conductive suits head to toe, which eliminates any electric field from their body, any electrical differential, like from one hand to the other or from head to toe, so they can actually do live line work. The magnetic field is fairly intense, but the maximum permissible ex exposures for magnetic fields are like a quantum level higher than anything we could uh, experience, and so they can carry on and do their productive work for four or five whatever hours it is a day. Hmm. Interesting. So there's no consideration for the electric and magnetic fields per se other than immediate contact for electric fields. Now, I did also, I looked over the study that, that you mentioned, the first one. I, I didn't get a chance to look at the second one with the kids, but it also mentioned um, other other types of health issues they looked at, like brain cancer, and um, I believe there may have been a, a few others that they looked at. They didn't find much of a correlation, except I think there was one maybe with brain cancer, and there were some issues with the study because um, there were supposed to be three electric utilities involved originally and they really only got a lot of data from one of them is is that accurate well when you look at the effects it's easy to identify short-term effects because you take a, a cage put a bunch of chipmunks in it or whatever animal you want you crank up a field and you start seeing things happening beyond a certain point, and you start making conclusions. However, when you want to find out what happens in real life, you, can't, you cannot really uh, afford to wait for 10 years for something low-level to show up. So, unfortunately, you end up doing these epidemiological studies, which are after-the-fact studies, to find out what kind of exposure the person could have possibly had over the last 5 or 10 or 20 years but then when you, have to, when you think about it, if people can develop leukemia under intense exposure, and let's say they do not reach that end goal of leukemia, could they develop other biological interactions that are absolutely negative, that are not as bad as leukemia along the way? Mm -hmm. I, I think absolutely so. 
Interesting. And, and could it even be things as, you know, we may say as simple as, but um, sleep disruption, you know, or uh, I know I sent you an email about uh, hearing issues that, that I have in the home here in the evening. I, I get that tinnitus kind of, uh, you know, ringing. That go, but I notice that when I go to bed and all the electric shut down, I'm not right next to anything. It seems to back down a little bit. Now, that's not definitive evidence of anything. But, um, you know, have there been studies that have looked at things like that? Uh, for those harmonics, no. The harmonics being multiples of 60 hertz, there are standards designed to limit interference to the waveform of the 120 volts, and that is primarily to prevent electronics from malfunctioning. Uh, to give you an example, I have a gorgeous stereo amplifier uh, that I use in my hi-fi system here. It was given to me by my brother from Dallas, and, and I'm not talking about the distance simply because it's a different house. In his house, it would not work. So my son saw it, he liked it, and he says, can I have it? Sure. So he took it to his place in New York City, and in his place it would not work either. It came back here and it works fine. Hmm. So the, the distortion, the level of harmonics, the electrical noise, for lack of better words, in the electric system in my house, the waveform of the 120 is cleaner than both of my brother's and my son's places. And so those are technical issues based on electronics, not on people. So when we talk tinnitus, ringing in the ears, well, that's just coincidental. Your ear doctor will tell you that's a normal form of aging. Well, I don't think it's really all aging. I think it has a lot to do with the electrics, in that when you turn something off and your tinnitus dies down and you repeat that process maybe a couple of times, you start noticing, hey, it's consistent. Maybe I don't need a thousand people to study it because I can prove it time and again. And all that matters for me is what it does for me. In interesting. So let's go back to the, the power lines, the major transmission lines. Um, what do you tell people, you know, you're, you're very knowledgeable about this field. What do you tell people who are considering buying a home uh, fairly close to these major power lines? Do you suggest they not do it at all or do you give them some guidance on how they could do it, but reduce any potential for issues they may, uh, you know, may incur as a result of buying that home? Well, you have to deal with the individual because some people being more sensitive to their environment than others, they may be concerned about um, vegetation control chemicals thrown on the right of way. Um, they may be concerned about uh, mosquito control chemicals or anything else that they want to use. Um, interesting. I didn't think based about on that. The, go ahead. I, I just thought that's interesting. I didn't think about that. That's a good point. Um, also, in addition, the two, uh, 200,000 and higher bulk transmission lines generally have a well-defined corridor and I remember one client who had bought a home in the summertime, and in the wintertime when the leaves fell off, they could now see through the trees this giant power line behind their house. Mm. Well, there's a colleague I work with intermittently who can set up a counter magnetic field to make the magnetic field from the power line vanish in the home. <laughs> but that gets to be expensive, and so it's not a recommendation I make on a dime, you know, just here, do this. No. Sure. Okay. Hey, let me, before I go too far down the road here, Cliff, I want to make sure if you want to jump in and uh, have any follow ups for, for Sal. Yeah, I, I do, Sal. One of, or thanks for joining us. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned were errors uh, made in, in the home. And I suspect these are either made by the homeowner or the electrician. Uh, it, I, I, what I don't understand is how they would make an error and not cause a short or not cause a fire or not cause it to get hot. Could, could you explain that? Sure. Um, the basic circuit coming out of your circuit breaker panel will have two wires, one at 120 volts and the other one presumably at zero volts or very close to it. 
And if I have three dozen of these circuits scattered about the home, inevitably there will be some place where there will be three or four light switches grouped together somewhere, living room, kitchen, whatever. And it's also very likely that in this box there will be two sources of power, so two cables coming from the panel. Well, you don't want to join the ones that are mm -hmm. at 120. They may cause a flash, and so that doesn't happen. But the ones at zero volts are easy to glob together. And so it is common and has been common for apprentices and or electricians and or homeowners to take these return wires at zero volts and gang them together so now you have two circuits, one, let's say, going counterclockwise in the house and the other one clockwise. They meet at the far end, and you have the neutral wires, the return wires gang together, and now anytime you use either circuit, the supply current is no longer the return because the return splits in two different directions. This causes a magnetic field. This causes maintenance issue for an electrician because he may de-energize a circuit thinking it's dead, go to work on it, and he gets shocked from the other circuit as a feedback. So it's easy to do these errors, and you don't think about it, and the lights still work, and you think everything is fine. Not necessarily. Did, did, I, did I explain it clearly, Cliff? Yeah, you did. How, how does one diagnose that, then? Well, uh, one of the ways is to turn off all the circuits in that panel, lift a single return wire, one of those neutrals, and check it for electrical continuity from that wire that you have disconnected to the point where you just disconnected from. It should have no electrical continuity. If it has any continuity, a low resistance, that means that that neutral is connected to either another neutral or ground somewhere else in the house. And so then you commence tracing that circuit by injecting a signal and tracing it through the house. And in all cases, you don't need to open the walls. With the proper tools, you inject the signal, and you can trace it easily through the house and find it where it's going and then fix it simply by pulling out the switch covers, pulling out the switches, separating the return wires, and everything goes back to normal. Let me. Uh, it, it, it's it's an art that most electricians have not perfected, just for what it's worth. <laughs> I find, I, I don't know, it, electricians, um, the, there's a wide range of different electricians and, and their abilities vary tremendously um it's a it's a fascinating area i think for a lot of people so let's let's go back now to i want to kind of go from the the major power lines down to you know we, we step down to the ones that go across the road here and then one that comes from the road to my home what kind of things do you recommend that consumers and and indoor environmental professionals watch for with respect to those lines coming from the major lines, I guess, to the road. That probably shouldn't be too much of an issue, but from a road to our home. Well, when you have those wires coming to the home, you think that the end goal is the house. That is correct. But because of a design flaw in the way that the engineering design is, the three wires providing three separate sources of power, um, there is a need to provide a backup to the middle wire, the neutral, because if that neutral becomes frayed, l loose, or broken, then the two wires at 120 will redistribute their voltage to the devices that are turned on unequally, and that is a fire hazard. So in most cases, you end up having the electrical neutral Coming in from the utility, connected to your water pipe, connected to your coaxial cable for television, connected to your ground for the telephone wiring, and anything else metallic within the house. So if the house is more than a couple of years old, you need to consider that there could be current flowing anywhere and everywhere. Hmm. Um, and if you happen to be one of those indoor air quality or IP professionals where you do remediation and you have to undo anything metallic, you might as well consider having rubber gloves when you do that. Hmm. Um, 
But in any case, all of these systems are mechanical, and they do degrade over time simply by oxidation. Uh, most people think electric systems are forever. They're not. Okay. Sal, we're going to stop, and we're going to uh, thank our sponsors, and we're going to come back with the second half of our show today with Sal LaDuca in about 90 seconds. IAQ Radio would like to thank our association sponsors. The Indoor Air Quality Association, a nonprofit multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Visit them at iaqa.org. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, who use advanced sensor software technology and embedded computers to provide superior environmental test instrumentation. Visit them, wolfsense.com. IAQ marquee sponsors are. John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Healthy Indoor Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions are available at iaq.net. Particles Plus, engineers and manufacturers feature rich particle counters, air quality monitoring, instrumentation, and vacuum pump technology. ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Okay, we're back. The second half of our interview, we've got Sal LaDuca. We're talking electric, electromagnetic fields, and IEQ. So another topic I hear um, discussion of with respect to indoor environmental quality and electric is the the smart meters that, um, you know, they don't have to send a guy up to your house anymore and check the amount of electric you've used because they're adding these new smart meters and there's been concerns, at least in some parts of the country, about, I don't know whether it's the electric field or the electromagnetic field, but can you talk to listeners a little bit about that topic? Uh, I can try. Electric meters, um, smart meters, are a wide topic to chat about. They have been around for 20-plus years, mostly for industrial customers, because when a utility feeds uh, an industrial customer lots and lots of power. They need to know moment by moment how much they're using, what their pattern of usage is. So if they have to compensate by bringing on extra generation, they can know to do that. Um, when you get down into the residential levels, you have also several generations in that uh, a smart meter, by definition, is anything that uh, allows documentation or recording of time of day usage. The older analog meters simply read the instantaneous value and a cumulative number with little wheels that a meter reader person looked at once a month. The digital devices allow not only that same information but allows them to identify whether you use most of your power in the daytime and which hours in the daytime or the evening and so on. In addition to this, now you get some of the smart meters having wireless connectivity to their system. You can have several variants of these. You can have one for the water meter, one for the gas meter, one for the electric. I have a smart meter for my water service. There is a guy that draws around in my neighborhood once a month. He pings all of the smart meters in the neighborhood. They reply back. He gets information, and he's gone. The problem that some of these people are getting a little hyper about is the ones are the ones connected to the electric service in that they have power and they can be transmitting like a cell phone every 30 seconds or so on. And in some cases, perhaps even more, in that there are different networks where you could have a central meter transmitting almost constantly where all the little slaves in the neighborhood only transmit to it every 30 seconds. But that's only part of the issue of, of the exposure, because the radio frequency is only one part of it. Being a digital device, it will also introduce harmonics into your electric system. Being also at a central point, those harmonics will show up everywhere else in the house. So if your house is running totally incandescent, nothing nonlinear like a digital device, and they introduce this digital meter in your house, your house will have electrical noise or harmonics from this smart meter. 
And in some cases, that can be a problem because, like you mentioned, some people can have tinnitus that shows up from the harmonics riding on the electric field of the wiring in the house. Well, the smart meter would be one of those things that would do that. I so see. you can look at it from the electrical noise perspective, from the radio frequency perspective, and in any one case, there are so many variations that you can only check by actually measuring. Okay. So that sounds like a topic that we could spend an hour on, so I, I want to go ahead and move forward, but I, I want to come back to that at a later point when we talk about evaluating these uh, situations. Okay. But from there... So then from there, you know, the, the, the electric comes into the home and, and we've got some kind of a circuit breaker there. And, you know, I've been told by my electric company, I've got to change my circuit breaker. I've got an old model that apparently um, they've had some issues with over the years. I think it was more of a fire-related issue. But I'm wondering, you know, it led me to think about this show. Um, are there other issues that we should be thinking about with respect to how those are installed and how we operate them? And uh, do you have any tips for listeners on those? Well, for existing construction, um, there isn't much in the way of, let's say, I prefer one type of breaker over another. Mm -hmm. Because going back to the comment by Cliff that there is a possibility of wiring errors in the home, if you decided to install ground fault circuit breakers in every breaker position, the ones with the wiring errors would not close. They would remain tripped. You would try to close them and they trip back out. There's another type of uh, circuit breaker uh, known as the arc fault circuit breaker, which is new in the last several years, has now begun to be implemented in new construction. And it is similar to ground fault in that it checks the balance between the supply and return currents, but it also looks for unusual sparking type behavior to trip a circuit. Um, these might be desirable either in new construction or in a home that is in existence where there's remediation going on, if you need to have power to your equipment, rather than using off-site power, you may want to use their breaker panel. You could install some ground fault or arc fault devices in there to power your devices. Hmm. Would If I'm doing a, a gut on a home, would you recommend adding these, you know, arc fault <laughs> devices uh, to my, you know, to all my electrical uh, outlets. Uh, it may be worthwhile because when you think about it, if you're using a hair dryer or something else electric and you drop it into a tub of water, if the water is dirty, it will trip the breaker if it's a ground fault or arc fault. If the water is clean, it may not necessarily trip the breaker right away because clean water is not very conductive. Dirty water is very conductive. Hmm. But you also have to consider the expense because a normal standard breaker may cost four or five bucks. A ground fault or arc fault may cost thirty to forty dollars a piece. I see. Okay. And it, so um, I, cost uh, alone can be an issue. It could. And I was thinking about the you know, the wiring issue and that you would pick up on that because you know, you would have you, you they'd be constantly tripping. Um, I assume there's an easier way to pick up on that. We'll we'll talk about that more on uh, the second show. I think. Uh, okay. But, uh, well, I mentioned the cliff, and I'd f for, in, in the few moments I spoke with him about the issue, how to test it out. But installing a circuit breaker of these type, arc fault or ground fault, would immediately identify which circuits are bad. Interesting. Okay. Um, let's talk next about from there okay so from from that circuit breaker we've got wiring going through our homes and then we've got you know electrical outlets we've got switches we've got uh, you know the the basics of, of electrical setup in your home what can you tell first of all i sent you an email about the tinnitus and you sent me something back saying i can guarantee you you have this type of wiring in your house. i pretty much guarantee you um, talk to us a little bit about the type of wiring in, in people's homes and the differences. Like, uh, you know, I've got an old house over the hill. It's still got some old knob and tube, but I think most of it's been, you know, changed over to, uh, what I guess we used to call it Romex, and now we've got another type of wiring. Talk to listeners a little bit about those and the, the pros and cons. Okay. Um, the wiring type that I suggested was in your home with good certainty is Romex. 
Romex, because it is easier to work with and the armor type, it has a slinky type metallic armor on it, uh, and it, it's less likely to get stra- scratched uh, working with Romex, it gets put in by default. So you can probably figure out that 80 to 90 percent or more of North America is wired with Romex. So the first thing I hear when I get a call that somebody is complaining about one thing or another, please describe what type of wire you have. And that is one of the initial issues. The other one, the other type of wire would be armored, and that's known as either BX for a slightly older type, MC for newer types. But in any case, it's armored, and the metallic armor is connected to the electrical ground, so it eliminates about 99% of all electric field emissions. Hmm. So that tinnitus that you were mentioning probably would not happen with those type of wires. So maybe it's not such a good idea to remove that from from my home over the hill here. Well, if you have the old uh, BX, it's probably functional. I would not touch it. Okay. If you have knob and tube, that is the ancient stuff. The knob and tube provides the greatest uh, presence of electric and magnetic fields because supply and return wiring are usually separated by a foot and a half or so, uh, stapled to uh, each support beam as they go up and down or sideways. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you have knob and tube, definitely take them out. If you have Romex, I would work with that in the way if you identify what circuits feed your bedroom, shut them down so you can sleep quietly. But I wouldn't recommend ripping the walls open to change wiring. That that gets prohibited. Sure. Now, let me ask about the knob and tube. Um, a lot of people abandon that in place. It's it's not connected to anything. I'm you know, not being very knowledgeable on the topic. Is that okay to just leave it in place, or are there are some potential issues with that? Uh, no. Leaving it abandoned in place, if it's not energized, is fine. It's just a piece okay. of wire. Okay. Okay. Um, as in, as in the situation where I was talking earlier about the sheet of paper with aluminum backing, that provides a much wider surface area. Now that gets into uh, a secondary antenna effects, but a single wire that is just running here and there and so forth that is de-energized, disconnected, that's not an issue. All right. And, and with respect to the, the wiring and how it's set up, a lot of people have these little cheap, you know, the testers, you, you plug it in the wall, you get either a red light or a green light or two or a yellow or whatever. Do you recommend that, you know, both environmental consultants and homeowners purchase that type of equipment and check all their outlets? Um, no, because the common three LED testers will lie to you. No. Oh, okay. um, you know how when you have a three-prong outlet, you're supposed to have 120 volts on the one mm-hmm. and zero on the other two? Sure. If you reverse that relationship to where you have 120 in the other two wires and zero where you're supposed to have 120, that little indicator with the three LED will tell you everything's fine. Hmm. What you need is a tester that actually and physically positively tells you whether you have 120 volts on the ground lug. And that can be a screwdriver with a neon bulb in it where you physically touch the ground lug hole and it tells you whether there's voltage on there or not. And you can use that also to check where the voltage is on which of the slots on the outlet. A screwdriver? The, I assume this is something with a neon. you purchased this yeah, somewhere, you, right? You don't make it yourself. <laughs> no, 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 no. I wouldn't. I would recommend making it yourself. But you key into any search engine... Um, a neon screwdriver and look for the images you'll find many that have a transparent handle which is what we're talking about um, and it's no more than about six inches long eight inches long perhaps and it's got this neon bulb in it with a resistor in it that limits any amount of current that could flow through it okay i'm glad i asked because um you know i think it's a, a how much oh they're eight uh, john just pulled one up for me eight dollars and 17 cents at lowe's so it's not an expensive item either, but it certainly would be something I think anyone could get uh, could get some use from. Oh, well, absolutely. And with that thing alone, you basically you can discard the three LED tester because the three LED tester can tell you everything's fine. You plug something in, and now you have 120 volts on the entire frame of the equipment. That is not cool because you touch something else, you can get electrocuted. Interesting. 
Interesting. So, all right. Well, let's let's move now from, you know, the wiring in the home to the, what we've got plugged in, or the switches, or the fans, or, or or whatever else we've got. I guess this is where it starts to get pretty complicated because there are so many different types of appliances and lights and so on. The first thing I noticed that you said was. Um, and maybe we could talk a little bit about the different types of lighting that people use in their homes. You know, we've gone from the incandescent bulb, and then we went to the uh, fluorescence. Of course, we've been around for quite a while, and now you've got the LEDs. Can you talk about the differences between those and what you recommend for people with respect to, you know, keeping their home a little safer for them electrically, not just electrocution or fires, but if they have concerns about, electric fields and you know, electromagnetic fields, what do you recommend? Uh, we used to have incandescent, and they went out of style because we became environmentally conscious, or so we thought. So we decided, yeah, let's go to compact fluorescent. Well, they contain mercury. Uh, they don't produce clean lighting. All right, well, let's try LEDs. Well, they're more monochromatic. They produce noise and so on. So there is a replacement for the standard incandescent. It's known as quartz halogen. It's a bulb that has a little capsule inside of it that is pressurized with halogen gas, and it's about 30% more efficient than a standard incandescent lamp. It does not produce any electrical noise, no harmonics, whereas if you use fluorescent lighting of any type, LED lighting of any type, that would be the equivalent of you having a dimmer switch in use, which will produce copious amounts of harmonics and bring on the tinnitus and bring on everything else and so forth. Um, I went to a home that had a dozen of these dimmers in place, and the dimmers had such a dramatic, sharp rise in current demand for all of the lights in use that the sharp rise was producing enough harmonics to spread into the radio frequency spectrum. So I was measuring radio frequency, and I was turning around trying to figure out which direction it was, and I could not find any direction. The radio frequency source was all around me. So I asked the client, I said, please get an electrician to remove all these dimmers, and I'll come back. Well, I had the occasion to go back three months later. All the re dimmers were removed, and so now we were back to incandescent lighting. There were no radio frequency issues in that house except the one wireless router. So the electrical noise alone from these devices can not only be irritating to us individually, but also encroach into the radio frequency, and now you cause interference with other stuff. Interesting. So you pretty much would recommend that people not use these dimmers? No dimmers, no LEDs, no fluorescent of any type. Okay. Well, that, that makes Quartz it allergen. easy. That makes it easy. Quartz allergen, um, more expensive, I assume. Well, uh, yes, you may pay two or three bucks for them, where the old incandescent, you might have paid 50 cents to a dollar. Okay. And you have to be kind of like a fox because you can walk into a hardware store and you ask for quartz allergen. And even though this is a major hardware store, the guy may not know what you're talking about. So you have to go look for yourself. And do they last longer than the typical incandescent? Uh, depending on the manufacturer. I've gotten some that have been lasting for three to five years uh, each. I have some that have been lasting maybe six months, and it all belongs really to the source manufacturer. Interesting. Okay. All right. So th that's the lighting, and a little bit about the lighting. Obviously, we can go into more detail uh, later. Now let's look at the different appliances that uh, people have in their homes, which I noticed in my email to you, you, you mentioned that um, I may be increasing the, I think it was the harmonics issue because of my flat screen TV versus the old style with a tube in it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. The flat panel TVs uh, are really a step backward in electrical cleanliness, for lack of a better description. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened is that by going to flat panel displays, yes, we have higher definition of the picture, but we also use a switching power supply to convert the 120 provided to it 
to all the various internal DC voltages. These switching power supplies and the current they demand can introduce harmonics and now go back into the power system and rebroadcast out to every circuit in your house. Hmm. So what do we do about that? I mean, you go back to the old... Well, uh, I, 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 yeah, go back to the old Sony Trinitrons or things of that sort. I don't know what to tell you, but I think a lot of it has to do with the level of engineering that is put into these devices in that there are filters that can be integrated within the power supply that minimize the feedback into the power system. Okay. But like things like uh, compact fluorescent lamp and LED lamps don't have any filtering in them really to speak of because the switching supply really could sit on your thumb and be not much bigger than uh, the size of a quarter and maybe uh, an inch thick with all the different devices on it. So they really cannot cram the exotic filtering in those small devices. On a digital television, they have the space for it, but it all gets into the economics. If I have to put in good filtering, I have to pay an, uh, an engineer more time to design it, and then I have to justify that increased expense with the customer. Are they going to be willing to pay for it? I would imagine these are available, though. Do you know? Well, power line filters are available as standalone devices, but these are generic, and they're not designed for an appliance. They're designed for something that produces harmonics from 100,000 cycles on up. Well, most of the most irritating harmonics, which are the strongest, are near 60 cycles like 180 cycles, 300 cycles, 420, um, and so on. These are the strongest ones, and the power line filters don't handle them very well. Discrete filtering within the device, within the flat panel TV, could get rid of much of that from getting back into the power system. Well, that, that's actually what I was asking about, is the TVs themselves, do, they, do manufacturers sell a high-end model that has these filters already built in? Uh, possibly, but if they do, they're not advertising it as such. They, they Think of it this way. If I advertise something that is high-tech, that eliminates harmonics, is the customer going to understand when he comes in shopping for a TV? No. Not, not no. most. In the same way that if you advertise a, 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 an air cleaner that specifically gets rid of all aspergillus. Well, most people have no clue what aspergillus is. Okay, okay. Um, so, go ahead. All right, Cliff, you got a quick question, I understand. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do, Joe. Thanks. So, let's go back to our uh, event at the summit. And one of the things that I had in my presentation was I had read that, uh, you know, when you have electric motors, uh, they can attract dust because of. I don't know, either electrical fields or magnetic fields or, or whatever. And I just want to know whether or not that, that's true or it's not true and, and why. There is a study on the street that I've heard about but not uh, cited that when you have um, high voltage, uh, air currents, all the appropriate variables mixed in, um, you can cause dust to become electrically charged and more easily played out on surfaces. Because as you take a look, if you see a motor that's been running continuously for, I don't know, a year, two years, you'll find that there's dust accumulation on the very specific areas of the motor. Because of airflow, simply just like a filter. But you can also find that you can have accumulation on the wiring as well because the electric fields associated with a cord, the electric fields associated with power lines can charge those particles. It doesn't take much. And that charge can cause them to more easily play out. Okay, thank you. All right. So it's electrical, it's not magnetism. No, it's mostly the electrical. And, in fact, I wanted to ask you about a part in your presentation where you had mentioned that there was a study where 
possibly electrical could somehow influence mold growth, and I wanted to look at that somewhere. No, no, not mold growth. Um, what I said was that uh, I, I found a st I found study and information on why dust particles, you know, would attract around electrical motors. I, I didn't say anything about mold. Okay, okay, okay. So it was not mold related. No, that, dust particles. No. That is simple. You, you charge the, the dust. You cause air motion past the surface, and they'll plate out on that surface. Okay, I've got a couple final questions here. Um, I've got one, Cliff. If you want to jump back in, let's. Uh, we're going to wrap up part one here. It's been really interesting, Sal. So I want to ask. Um, you know, when we do indoor environmental quality courses, we we look at. You know, here, here's one of the big issues. You know, the big first thing you should always look at, and number one in my mind is carbon monoxide poisoning. You know, if, if you're not using some kind of carbon monoxide meter when you go into people's homes or buildings or whatever, then uh, maybe you should consider a different line of work because, you know, that, that seems to me like a very fundamental issue that we should all be able to handle. With respect to the electric uh, and EMFs, electrical fields and EMFs, what's the number one thing you would suggest that people watch for? Bright and dim lights simultaneously. This can happen such that you turn on the lights in the living room and lights in a dining room, and the lights in the dining room are dimmer than the lights in the living room. Not because of wattage, not because of the number of bulbs, but because the voltage on the one feed is lower than the voltage on the other one. This is an indication of a failure of the main neutral coming from the utility, and it is a fire hazard. Hmm. Good. That's an interesting. All right. And... Um Another thing I wanted to ask you to do was just give a, a, a basic tip for IEQ professionals and consumers about, you know, making improvements in their, in their electrical IEQ understanding. You know, what, what would you say, you know, how do you, how do you learn this stuff or uh, what's a good book or a good, good video or something like that to give us the basics and, and to get us a foundation from which to grow? Well, I worked for the U.S. Navy for six years, and the Navy has um, a course on electrical and electronics that is freely available on the Internet, uh, on TPUB, T -P -U -B, um, and it is also available on disk from that same source. And you can read it at your convenience on the Internet, and it, it basically brings you up from the basics of the laws of physics through electrical phenomena, how things are put together, how they work. Well, thank uh, you. But practical experience would really go hand-in-hand um, hand to reinforce the teaching from the book, from the material. Understood. And what we're going to do is uh, we're going to recommend folks go to that. We'll have Cliff put that in his, in his blog. And then hopefully we'll all have a little better background when we bring you back after the first of the year. Okay. I don't have the exact link. I will forward that to you so you can put it on your blog if you wish. We would appreciate that, Sal. And we really appreciate you and your, your willingness to join us and get us all up to speed a little bit on the electric, electromagnetic fields and IEQ. This is Radio Joe Hughes saying thanks to this week's guest, Sal LaDuca, to my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. John, you gotta have faith, and most importantly, our growing group of loyal listeners. We'll be back next Friday at noon. Next Friday, we've got an interesting show. We're going to talk with uh, Pete Consigli and uh, Mark Springer and uh, Phil, Phil McLaughlin, I think. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the RIA TPA conference and talk a little bit about this whole third-party administrator issue and restoration issues. So please come back and join us next Friday at noon for the next broadcast of IAQ Radio. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reel saying thanks for listening.